Excellent. Well, thank you, Rhett. Um, I'm really happy for today's demo because we, we are getting right into a couple use cases. Um, if you follow me on Twitter, you'll, you'll find that uh, I was pretty excited about uh, some of the things that we're going to show today. Uh, salt in general is an exciting technology. and um, So today we're going to have um, pretty much two demos that we're going to do. Um, one is going to be around software-defined networking, and another one will be multi-cloud Docker uh, deployment. So the, the second part of the demo requires me to deploy out some instances in Amazon. So uh, prior to um, kicking this off into the uh, presentation part, um, I have an HA proxy that's going to be in my demo. And the Docker systems that come up later, you'll, you'll find them listed here. Currently, I have no Docker containers, no websites um, listed here. And here's the website that we're going to take a look at later. You can see that nothing's working there because um, we haven't deployed out the system. So I'm going to come over here, and I'm using Salt Cloud with a map file. And I'm going to execute that off. And it's going to create three instances for me three uh, Docker hosts. I'm going to let that kick off. And we'll get over to the SDN part of the uh, presentation now. We'll jump back to uh, the salt cloud on the second half of the uh, presentation for the demo. So here, uh, what we did recently was we were working with some folks that had a software-defined networking infrastructure mixed with um, some other hardware. And here's a, here's a review of the, uh, an overview of the architecture that we're working with. And I'm going to get a little bit more into detail of what the workflow is going to be here for our demo. But up at the upper right corner, we have the Big Cloud Fabric. This is a Big Switch's SDN uh, fabric solution. And this is an appliance that's running on an ESX server that's managing this Big Cloud Fabric. Also on that ESX server, we have our Salt Master. And I have this jump box that I'm going to be using, this Windows jump box, to um, access one of the uh, Hyper-V servers. Now in the middle of the screen here, um, this is all Dell networking hardware. Um, at the top, we have an S6000. We have a couple other switches underneath. Now in a software-defined networking infrastructure, um, it's a it's the cutting edge uh, way of managing your network. This is a central point. It takes, a, takes away a lot of the administration overhead that you had before, and it just adds a lot of flexibility to a dynamic network environment that um, we're, we're more getting into when we start dealing with hypervisors and migration of virtual machines between hyper, uh, hypervisor servers. Um, there's some background noise if someone can mute. Okay. Um, all right. I'm going to continue hey, here. So hey, here in the – yes. Sorry about that. Um, if you could go into the, the phone icon and join up me in the top left of your uh, management panel there, um, there should be a uh, little microphone icon that uh, should allow you to mute all. Currently with you as presenter, it doesn't look like I have the ability to mute everyone, so I apologize. Okay. Um, I'm having a hard time finding that, but um, I, yeah. I think it was someone called out Eddie. Um, <laughs> I apologize. Uh, if you can mute your phone, everyone on online, if you can just confirm that you're on mute. So, in this software-defined networking in the center here, we have two lower level switches and these S4048s, these are Dell's new uh, open networking switches that allow this SDN um, management to happen. And that's the issue in this architecture here is um, a lot of the new networking hardware provides that ability to have the, the switch encompassed in this big cloud fabric. But um, right below that, we have a um, MXL switch, which is in a chassis. Um, this has uh, several servers attached to it. And that MXL doesn't have the ability to be a part of this 
software-defined networking fabric. So you get kind of a mixed environment what you have to manage. You have this legacy hardware. Um, you have the cool new software-defined networking that adds a huge amount of value to your infrastructure. But you have this black hole in between of management. And when you start talking about hypervisors migrating um, VMs from one hypervisor to another, you need this dynamic nature to not only be in your hypervisor level, but your networking level as well. And uh, what we did was we, we wanted to go in and try to bridge this gap for, um, for the, the customer in this situation. And here in our architecture, we have a couple VMs underneath, um, Ubuntu 2 and Ubuntu 1. These are just VMs on the individual Hyper-V servers. So some of the key things that we needed to address when we started looking at the, um, the tasks that we needed to accomplish here, first thing we needed to do is we needed to learn about the environment. We had to come up with this way of going into the switches and figuring out what's where, what's connected to what port. We also had to detect that VLAN modification. We had to know if a VLAN was necessary on a server or if it's not. Now, if you're new to networking, um, VLAN is kind of a, a way of inside of your network to kind of build a tunnel between individual systems on your network. Um, it's not a, a tunnel in nature, but it keeps traffic limited to only the necessary systems in that configured VLAN. What this provides you is the ability to lessen the traffic coming into your interface if, um, if you don't need to hear that traffic on the, the network switch that the other system's receiving. Um, you put yourself in a VLAN so you can separate yourself from the, the other traffic. Some network administrators to, to kind of bridge this gap today, what they'll do is just put all possible VLANs on every interface, and it kind of defeats the purpose of the VLAN in the first place. So we had to detect this VLAN modification on the hypervisor server. We also had to alert the system, uh, and in this case, we had to alert SALT to um, make the modifications required in the network to address that VLAN modification. And we did this by leveraging the knowledge that we had of the network layer that we gathered at the beginning. And then we needed to interface with the cutting edge SDN solutions. And in this case, Big Switch, uh, Big Cloud Fabrics API is an amazing API to interface with. But then we had to bridge that black hole of SDN to the legacy hardware. Okay, so here's our, here's our architecture again. What we're going to show in this demo, and it's going to go really quick, is the where I show here a deployment of a new VM on Hyper-V. We're actually the VMs are already deployed, but what we're going to do is I'm just going to go into Hyper-V and I'm going to change the VLAN that it's associated with to show that a that the um, VLAN modification can be observed. And this helps in the future as you're, as you're working if you do need to change a VLAN from, one, from, the hyper, or from the virtual machine to another VLAN, you can easily do that, and the network will be addressed at that point as well. So we're going to change the VLAN to VLAN 31. And on the Hyper-V server, we have a beacon, um, a salt stack beacon. Now, beacons are something that were, uh, it was introduced earlier this year in salt stack. Beacons are a wonderful technology. Salt when it was created, was created as a remote execution engine. And the way that it communicates its jobs down to its minions is over this event bus. And that's the, that's the heartbeat of, of SALT. So having these beacons was kind of a natural progression of SALT. And it's a very simple uh, Python based uh, module that you can build. You can put it on your salt master and easily deploy it out to the individual systems that require. In this case, I have a Hyper-V beacon that all this beacon does is every five seconds, it's watching the VLANs that are associated on that Hyper-V server. And once it detects something, in this case, after we deploy it, we'll see that the salt beacon is going to detect 
the VLANs that are currently on there, and it's going to compare it to a list that it's already created on the box. And it's going to see if, if there's any differences what it previously ran to what it's currently running. And it's going to compare that and say, okay, these VLANs were added or these VLANs were removed, or you know, a, a, a group of both of them. At that point, it sees here that VLAN 31 is new, so it's going to create an event, and it's going to drop it on that event bus that SALT has. And the Hyper-V server is, when it creates this event, there's going to be two pieces of information in here. It's going to have the MAC address of the Hyper-V server, and it's going to have the VLANs that need to either be added or removed. That's the only two pieces of information that's required to go on to the event bus. At this point, when the event gets to the master, I have a reactor here that is watching for that particular event to come in. And once it detects that, it's going to drop it off and it's going to validate the information that's in that event. And it's going to check, I see the MAC address for that Hyper-V1 server, and I see the VLAN that needs to be there. Now at this point, you can do a check in your organization to say, this VLAN number, um, you know, this range of numbers can be managed by that Hyper-V server. And what that allows you to do at this level is to segregate different departments in your organization to be able to manage a certain subset of VLANs, uh, depending on what server it's coming from. And this is very useful in uh, very large networks, multiple departments that you want to provide this ability to. At this point, the Minion 1 is going to be notified to update the VLAN. And Minion 1 is running on a master in this scenario here. And Minion 1 is going to make an API call to the Big Cloud Fabric. And in Big Cloud terms, they have these segments over there. And this segment is going to be updated with the information that it needs. And it's going to show that VLAN 31 needs to be added to this port group called MXL. And you can see that right in the center here um, that I have port group MXL because this. MXL switch here is plugged into these two switches for failover. And these are kind of an active-active um, configuration. This is all managed by the SDN infrastructure. But both of these ports need that VLAN 31 associated with it. So that API call is going to tell the big switch fabric, and the big switch fabric is going to take care of that. Now we need to finish the VLAN configuration, and we're going to have to talk directly to that MXL to bridge this final gap in, in the network layer. And we're going to talk directly to the MXL, and we know which MXL to talk to because of the information that we learned about the network, and we know that that Hyper-V MAC address is on this MXL. We're going to go into the MXL, and we're going to add in that VLAN 31 to the port groups and the individual interface, and in this case, this Hyper-V server is plugged into uh, interface 3 on an MXL. And at this point, you have the full communication now for VLAN 31. Every layer of the network is updated with that. Okay, so network discovery process. Now, this was broken out. When, when we decided to design this out, there's three distinct parts that are being designed here. We have a network database discovery part, which right now we currently um, discover MXL networks and the Big Cloud Fabric network. Then we have this layer of hypervisor VLAN beacons. And here we have the Hyper-V beacon that we're looking at. And we have the network execution modules. Now these are for actually interfacing with the MXL or interfacing with the Big Cloud Fabric. So in this network discovery process for the MXL and the Big Cloud Fabric, Minion 1 has a job that's going to execute periodically. And this is going to call out to the MXL or the switches that you have on your network and it's also going to talk to the Big Cloud Fabrics API, and it's get, going to gather the information required. Mainly what it's trying to do here is build a network um, MAC address to port mapping list. And over here on the left, you can see here just uh, some of the example data 
that would be in these two database sets. I separated database sets out to the MXL and the Big Cloud Fabric here. But you can see here, the, the key that I'm, I'm putting in here is going to be the MAC address of the device. So in this situation, you give me any MAC address, I can tell you um, either what port group it's on, what interface, and what switch it's on. In the Big Cloud Fabric, um, you can see here on the, the bottom of the forward data that um, this MAC address that ends in 10 is going to be on switch 4048-02, and it's going to be plugged into Ethernet 12. So it's a complete map of the organization. All right, so let's take a look at what this actually looks like. The first thing I'm going to show you is the Big Cloud Fabric website. Now, I know this is kind of hard to see, um, and I, I can't zoom in on here, but um, in the Big Cloud Fabric, we have these segments, and segments is a collection of VLANs. Now, here, we have a VLAN 30 segment, and that's what our two Ubuntu boxes are currently configured as, and we'll, we'll jump into those. And we can see here that it has one port group and one switch port. Now this port group membership, this is gonna be for the MXL, this is gonna be for Hyper-V1, so when we make the modifications to Ubuntu 1, we're gonna see that a new VLAN gets created here, VLAN 31, and we're gonna see that that port group is going to be reassociated with VLAN 31. It's going to be removed from VLAN 30. And then the switch port group is going to be for our other physical hypervisor server, uh, Hyper-V2 with Ubuntu 2. That's also going to migrate once we make the change. And let's jump into the... I'm going to log into the MXL switch here. And you can see here that I have one VLAN, or I have three VLANs. VLAN 21 is our management VLAN between all the systems. But VLAN 30 here, we can see that it's on port group 1 and interface 03. So now let's jump on to, this is Ubuntu 1. And we can see that looking at the Hyper-V configuration, Ubuntu 1 is on VLAN 30. And currently, uh, Ubuntu 1 is able to ping 10.1.1.60, which is Ubuntu 2, the VM that's on the other Hyper-V server. So we want to modify it and put it onto VLAN 31. And once I click Apply, you'll see in the background the ping has stopped. And we'll take a look at the VLANs. And we see that on the switch, now it's been updated to VLAN 31, but VLAN 30 is gone. So it not only added the new VLAN tag, it was able to remove the previous one. So it cleaned up after itself. But let's look at the big switch fabric. And I do a refresh here. And we went ahead and created VLAN 31, and we migrated that port group membership over. But we broke communication between these two devices. So now we're going to jump over to, this is Ubuntu 2. And Ubuntu 2, you can see here that it's trying to ping 10.1.1.50, which is Ubuntu 1 on the other box. But we broke that communication. We're going to change that to 31. And you can see just how fast that was. It reestablished the communication between 10.1.1.50. So let's come here, look at the big switch, and you can see that VLAN 30 is no longer there, 
And now this VLAN 31 that we migrated everybody to, uh, it also has a switch port group membership. So we completed um, both ends of that communication. So, so what really just happened here? Because it was very quick, it only took a couple seconds to happen. So manual steps required to add a VLAN. In this case, you'd have to determine what port and what switch the Hyper-V server is plugged into. You know, if, if you're standing there in front of the Hyper-V server in a data center, um, maybe five to 10 minutes. If you have good documentation, maybe five, 10 minutes. If you're remote from the server, it's gonna, it's gonna take you quite a long time to figure that out. You're also gonna have to log into the correct switch and make those changes. This could take one to two minutes to get um, the right IP address to the switch, jump on there. And if you're not the, if you're not the network admin, this could take one or two days uh, just to get the approvals to make that happen. You also have to determine what big cloud fabric or whatever SDN solution you have, um, what switch it's on, what the port groups are assigned. Um, this could be five to 10 minutes. Um, you know, to create that segment through the web UI. Now, it, it does provide a command line interface, but um, either way, you're gonna have to type in the commands and it's gonna take you some time. And then you're gonna, make, you're gonna have to make sure that the switch port group is in the right segment. So all of this, your best case scenario going through this manually, it's gonna take 15 to 30 minutes. Um, the cases that we see mostly though are between um, a week or several weeks to make something like that happen when you're talking about cross-team uh, involvement here. So it, it becomes a problem and then what comes out of having such a, a long time to implement this is workarounds that really go against best practices for network management or systems management. And, and that's what I alluded to earlier about just blasting a bunch of VLANs out there. Now, with SaltStack, during the orchestration here, you were looking at three to five seconds for that to happen. Going through this full demo completely, doing it manually, and we've gone through this many times doing it manually just to make sure that we knew all the steps that were needed. Um, we, we knew what we were doing every single time, and it was no less than 30 minutes it took us uh, to get, get this fully completed across the stack. Using the SaltStack orchestration process here with the beacons, yeah, that was five seconds or less, and we're talking about using the beacons, changing VLANs on multiple servers. Now, because this is in SALT, you can do documentation through this whole process, because sometimes you might look at it and go, well, I don't know if I want these VLAN configurations. You know, there's, when we do this approval process, um, you know, there's people who need to know about what's going on in this, and you don't have to eliminate that. Um, those, those additional steps, you can integrate those into this process. This is the high-speed process of getting it done. You can have emails sent out. You can have Slack messages go out. There's a lot of steps that you can take there. So after we built this, what was exciting was we started to look at what we had here and what we could do with the information that we had. The first thing that we came up with was we know when a new MAC address is on the network. Okay, by doing this polling of the network devices, we know every single time a new MAC address comes up. So now we can set it up that as soon as someone plugs into the network, if it's a new device on a network, we can be notified of that. Network mapping. Network documentation is pretty much outdated the minute that it's, it's saved to a file. Um, networks are extremely dynamic, and this provides that ability to have that dynamic networking ability. So you know what device is plugged in where you can, you can bridge that into your monitoring systems so you can get more in-depth information. Um, I worked for a monitoring software company uh, prior to SALT and we did really well at um, taking a server and knowing what its, its interface was doing um, through performance counters and we could go to switches and we can tell you what each of the ports were doing. But to get that bridge between that switch interface and what server is actually connected to it, 
the mapping that we're doing here allows you to bridge that gap in other systems. We also came up with this bare metal hardware VLAN configuration. Sometimes um, folks will put in Pixie Boot systems on their network. Um, as I was talking about the benefits of VLANs earlier, to just pull the traffic down to only the systems that require it, this is where bare metal hardware provisioning comes in um, really well for, for this solution here. So a server can be plugged in physically. Um, you, know, you get a new server, you rack it in your data center, you plug it into that switch. You don't need to tell the network team what switch it's plugged into or what port you just plugged it into. Now they're probably going to want to know that, but you don't need to know that. You don't need to figure that out. They're going to be able to see it as well on the salt stacks salt stack side where we get that where they'll get that alert of what port it's plugged into. So at that point, if it's a bare metal provision server, it can be dropped off to a separate VLAN that's only for your Pixie booting. So you can keep your Pixie boot information and data transfer on a separate managed VLAN that the system automatically gets added to. And there's a ton of other things you can do with the information that's provided here. So that covers our SDN demo um, and, and all the things that, that we're doing there with software-defined networking. The second part of this demo is our multi-cloud Docker uh, deployment and website um, configuration. So at the beginning of this webinar, I kicked off a salt cloud map and I showed you the HA proxy. Well, that salt cloud map file, what it did was it went out to my AWS um, infrastructure. I deployed the cloud map here. It went ahead and it deployed two instances, brand new instances out into Amazon. It also went out to DigitalOcean and deployed one droplet out there. Now with Salt Cloud, it's going to go ahead and install the minion and it's going to start all the configuration that you have set up for it. So in this case, I have a high state set up because when these boxes came up, I said that they were going to be um, they were going to be a uh, cool site. Um, the, the role that they were going to be was this cool site website. And a part of their high state was that they were going to install Docker. Once Docker was installed, it's going to download an Nginx image, and it's going to spin up two containers on these uh, certain ports. It's also going to update the HA proxy server once these containers are deployed. And at that point, we can see the website, all the new files that are out there, and we'll see that the HA proxy is now looking at all of those Docker containers that are running on there. Now, all we did at the beginning of this to make this happen was deploy out that cloud map. We had none of this infrastructure before. We didn't have um, these three hosts or none of the containers running. This is all uh, started at the beginning of this webinar. Now, the second part of this is, well, the website that's being shown in these Nginx containers, the content for that is in a GitHub repo. And what I'm doing is I set up a webhook in this Acme um, GitHub repo to tell the Salt API that's on my master to deploy out that new code. So the, the repo kicks off a, an API call to Salt, and then the files are going to be updated automatically from the master. So once your Docker containers are up and they're mapped to some local files to show the website. If you want to make updates to those files, in this second scenario here, all you're going to do is a GitHub commit. Uh, I'm sorry. I have too many phones in my house. Okay. So now I need to switch boxes. And it's just going to take me a second here. Okay. 
So here's that HA proxy again. I did a refresh on it here, and I see now that I have these six containers that are listed here. Here's the website, and if I refresh it, I have my website. So what this proves to me is that I have my containers deployed, and they're running my website. The class for next week got quite a few people in it, doesn't it? Um, uh, can uh, I think we have one person that needs to go on mute? Signed up yet. Hello? Um, all right. Let me uh, bring up. So at this point, we have our website deployed. And one other thing that happened during the deployment process was that I had my state files communicating to my Slack um, deployment here for Home Lab to let me know the different systems that were deployed. And I can see that Docker 1 host, Docker host 2, and Docker host 3 have all been deployed and working. So here, on the left-hand side, I'm looking at my Saltmaster. And on the right side is a running um, list of the jobs that are coming in. And you can see that there was a mine update from Docker Host 3 that was providing some information here. Now in this window here, this is my GitHub repo that manages that website, Acme, that, that we saw just a second ago. And if I do a git diff, you can see here that I currently have a um, an update that I made to the file. Currently, the GIF that's being presented there is yes.gif, and I'm changing this to clapping.gif. I'm going to commit this change. And I'm going to jump over here, and if you're looking at the job queue over here to the right, you'll see that a lot of things just happen here. And I also got a notification in Slack. If I jump over to Slack, I can see here the website has been updated from environment dev. If I come back here to the website and I do a refresh, I can see that the update has made it out to my containers. So that is a full cycle of what we showed here earlier. So just to go over this again, I set off the cloud map file at the very beginning with Salt Cloud. It deployed out an instance in DigitalOcean and Amazon, two instances. It deployed out Docker. It installed or downloaded the um, Nginx image spun up a couple containers, and it also brought over the files from the Acme website. At the end of that, it updated the HA proxy. So the HA proxy now had all the Docker containers that were running in the ports that were associated with them. And it allowed our website to happen. But then we made an update to the website. We committed it to GitHub. That triggered off a reactor inside of Salt which then updated the files only on my Docker host. And that is the end of the second um, demo. Um, I'm going to pass this over to Rhett now. Yeah, thank you, Rob. Uh, that was great. Um, I, as a reminder, uh, if, if, if anybody does have any questions, please enter them into the chat window provided in, in join.me. So far, we have not had any questions come in, which is seems a little bit odd. Um, but uh, we'll give everybody a second to um, queue up any questions if they have them, as uh, I take a second to remind folks uh, that uh, if you like what you saw here today and you need more, um, please consider uh, attending SaltConf 16. 
uh, we uh, plan to have registration open for SaltCon 16 uh, within the next few days. Um, and just as a reminder of the details, uh, it is scheduled for you know, the week of April 18th, specifically uh, April 19th through 21st, 2016 in Salt Lake City. Um, this is our third annual uh, Global User Conference. Uh, tons of content like what you've seen here today from Rob, in addition to um, uh, in addition to many use cases from our customers and users. And uh, we've got some uh, early bird discounts on registration available. We have uh, discounts on the pre-conference training, which is always extremely popular. Um, and so all that information will be provided at solconf.com here uh, in, in the next uh, couple of days in terms of the, the registration going live. And as a reminder, if, if uh, you are interested in speaking in SOLCOM 16, um, the, the call for speakers is open for just a few more days. It's open through November 30th, which is Monday. Um, so uh, get those in uh, quickly for, uh, for our consideration, and, and uh, we'll take a look. Um, so as I uh, provided that Yeah, it looks like there's two plug. questions here. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. yeah. So... Um, the first question here is, uh, the switches that were being used are Dells. How did you implement the command changes for the interfaces and port channels? So um, as, I, as I showed in the, the three parts, let me, um, let me jump back to this part here. So the network modules that I have here, um, these are execution modules inside of SALT. Um, I have it plugged in for an MXL. So when you're talking directly to some of this hardware, the, the commands are going to be different. So the way that we architected this was to have the ability, if you, if you had other network hardware, let's say um, uh, uh, Cisco Gear or um, any other network manufacturers, all you would have to do in this architecture is build the execution module at that point to modify the VLAN. So we tried to make this as pluggable and loosely coupled as you know, SALT has internally. So um, if you needed to build other network support modules, you could build it in this section here. Um, and, and we are expanding this out. Currently, the, the current um, case that we were working with was just with Dell switches and Big Cloud Fabric. We do plan on expanding that out. And also the hypervisor uh, VLAN beacons, those are very lightweight as well to where the only thing that they need to watch is the VLAN's local and they need to create an event with their MAC address and the VLANs that need to change. So it's, it's very lightweight at that point. Um, and then of course on the network database uh, information background, it's all specific to the hardware. Um, and was this a state file? Um, well, I did have some state files that were being used, um, but for the management of the network and, um, well, for the MXL and the BCF, these were uh, state files that had calls into the uh, state modules and execution modules. So I hope that answered the question there. Okay, looks like we got a confirmation that did answer the question and uh, I don't see any other questions that have come in. And so I think this would be a good time to wrap up. I don't know, Rob, if you want to advance to the last slide there, if anybody has any questions and uh, they need to get in contact with either you or Salt Stack, um, we can post that info for folks. There we go. There you go. Um, yeah, so feel free to reach out. You can see our information there on the left. Uh, easy enough to get in touch with us. And then, and then uh, again, we appreciate your time and, and uh, the work that you put into uh, creating this demo and, and webinar for us, Rob. And, and if anybody does have any questions for Rob, you can see his info there. Um, Okay, thank you everybody for joining today. Like I said, we have recorded this uh, webinar. We'll provide it to all registered attendees and uh, we should do that within about 24 hours. Uh, so watch your, your inbox for the recording to this and uh, let us know if you have any other questions. Thank you again, bye-bye. Thank you, Rhett.